probably know by now Pastor Chris is sick and I will be filling in for him this evening. I'll be in prayer for him and his family. Uh, they, I'm not exactly sure uh, what they have. It does involve a, a fever, sore throat, headache. That's what Chris was telling me. So if you could uh, be in prayer for, for him. Turn, if you would, then uh, to the book of Second Kings. This is one of my favorite Old Testament Bible stories. There's many lessons here. I will be reading the entire chapter of 2 Kings chapter 5 of Naaman, known as Naaman the leper. And we'll be gleaning some truths from the scripture. One thing I wanted to point out perhaps before we begin is that the ancient church, not long after the apostles, was cursed with the prevalent philosophy of interpreting the scripture through allegorical means. In other words, everything in a story would mean something. Something would represent the twelve apostles, something would represent the Virgin Mary, something would represent the Ten Commandments, or whatever. There would be all these different things. Uh, whereas the, the proper interpretation is to read it as it is, and you'll, you'll see the lessons that are coming out to us, and they will also be applied from the New Testament as well. So, uh, we have to be careful to properly interpret Scripture. We're going to make an attempt at that this evening as we delve into the Old Testament in 2 Kings uh, chapter 5. The Word of God. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who was in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks quarrel with me. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha, Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned <coughs> and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if this prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. And he, re and he returned to the man of God. He and all his aides, and came and stood before him and said, 
Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives, before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. So Naaman said, Then, if not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Yet in this thing, may the Lord pardon your servant, but my master goes into the temple of Rimmon to worship there, and he leans on, on my hand, and I bow down in the temple of Rimmon. When I bow down in the temple of Rimmon, may the Lord please pardon your servant to this, in this thing. Then he said to him, Go in peace. So he departed from him a short distance. <coughs> but Gehazi pursued Naaman. When Naaman saw him running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master has sent me, saying, Indeed, just now two men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. So Naaman said, Please take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and handed them, them to, uh, to two of his servants, and they carried them on ahead of him. When he came to the citadel, he took them from their hand and stored them away in the house. Then he let the, man, the men go, and they departed. Now he went in and stood before his master. Elisha said to him, Where did you go, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant did not go anywhere. Then he said to him, did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money and to receive clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male and female servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out of his presence leprous, as white as snow. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we now ask, Lord, for your special blessing on the hearing and expounding of your word. May you teach us, Lord, the lessons you desire uh, from this story and from these principles that we will see. We thank you, Lord, for the many blessings that we enjoy. Be with us now in a special way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this particular narrative is one that is quoted by our Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 4. We'll get to that a little bit later as a picture of the Gentiles coming to the true God. The story itself is a beautiful picture of the gospel through illustration. As I mentioned, this is not allegorical, but a historical narrative which is full of biblical principles. And we have to be careful not to fall in the practice of allegorizing or of, of over-literalizing in some passages, as you'll find in, in some Bible and interpreters. And when you get to Revelation, for example, which we went through a while ago, you'll find people that will take everything literal, whereas the book itself is meant to be a picture of science. And so we have to be careful to interpret each thing properly. For example, Genesis. Genesis is a historical passage. Is that for me? Yeah. Oh, I, I have one. Sorry. Thank you, I appreciate it. I'm sorry, Deb. That's okay. Um, so we, 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 don't, we don't take it, these things literal where they're meant to be, be, be uh, uh, allegorical and vice versa. So in, in doing so, when we look at historical narrative, we take it as a historical narrative and look at the lessons which are coming out of it. One of the lessons here, I believe, is the universal depravity of man. Uh, there is no aspect of human life that is not affected by the fall of man. You look at this the station of Naaman. Naaman was a very important person. Now here you have him as the commander of the armed forces of the king, perhaps uh, Benhadad, I think it was. Uh, this man was favored by the king. He was used by God to preserve the Syrians from the takeover from possibly Assyria or some other nation. 
<clears throat> he is called a mighty man of valor. He was a good soldier. He was a create, courageous warrior. He was a person, person of very high status, but yet we find that he is also described as a leper. So regardless of his good points, all men are afflicted with some calamity. You know, we, we see this whenever we have our prayer time, our prayer requests. There's always something, somebody, who is suffering. There's always somebody suffering ailments of the body or spiritual problems. I have to excuse me again. I might need that cup if I run out of water. <coughs> I think it has to do perhaps with the change of weather. <clears throat> so Naaman is described as a leper, not that he had leprosy, but he's, he is actually identified with the disease that he had. He is a, a leper. And men need to realize, and I talk about men, men and women, humanity, uh, that they are not good people who sometimes sin. They are described as, in the scriptures as a sinner. They are so infected by sin, that is their title. You know, Naaman is titled a leper. He, he is identified as a leper just as humanity is described as sinners. Romans 3, 9 through 10. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Now, so we have a, a picture here of a man who is in, in great need. We have very few people in the Bible being described with no sin. There's only one, and that is, our, our, actually, there's, there, I mean, some have, where there aren't any sins mentioned, I think Joseph might be one, but we know that Joseph had sin. The exception to all of them, though, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one given the name above every name. When you think about this man's position, there would not be one person, not even the lowest slave in his nation, would want to change skins with him. And so you see this condition. And this is the proper view of man's condition. And I think, I know we, we harp on it frequently here about the depravity of man, but there is such a neglect of it in our evangelical culture that I think we need to be reminded of it. And we need to be confrontational sometimes about it whenever you have so many people that are undermining this doctrine and telling people that you're okay. You just need to look deep down inside of yourself and and pull yourself up and, and you, you can do it. You can do it. You can do this or that. And you, you're, you're not as bad as what you think. And there's goodness in everybody. All, you hear all these stories. We have to refute those things. Now, so then we see the value, secondly, in this story, the value of the word. But we have in this story a young maid. She's described here in uh, verse 2. It says she's, she's described as a young girl from the land of Israel. Now, this girl was probably around 10 years old. You know, whenever there's certain descriptions that are used in the Bible, that if you get to a certain age, she would be described as a maiden or described as a woman or whatever, a servant or woman. She's described as a, as a girl, as a young girl. So she's probably a very young girl that waited on Naaman's wife. And this girl is pivotal in the story. Insignificant. No one would ever notice this, this little girl, but she, she does something she, that, that alters the whole situation. Uh, we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame, put to shame the wise, and the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Now this, this girl gives a little bit of, of hope, I guess. She's expressing sympathy. Uh, she may not have even thought this through. But she said, if only my master could get to that prophet you know, in Israel, he could be cleansed of his leprosy. And this sparked something. This, this got the whole ball rolling here, where the, the man himself then goes to the king, and you see the great wealth then that is given to him, and so on, which we'll get to. But the girl's the one that got this started. The, the word went through the household. Whoever she sent it to, we don't know. It went through the household. 
eventually got to Naaman. Naaman then went to the king, and the king understood the seriousness of his condition and said, hey, if it, if it'll work, then we'll, we'll by all means go. And this, this girl didn't realize that her words would shake a kingdom, and two kingdoms. So you remember what happened when the king sent letter to the king of Israel. He thought he was going to be under attack. He thought the king was looking for a reason to, to go to war with him. So we have the, the king was being shaken here by this little girl. I think the application here is that we don't know how significant our words may be. We may some, say something just, just not even thinking about it, about the gospel, about somebody's need, and that word might be what the Lord uses to get somebody to think. And it doesn't matter the position in life that you, you may have. You know, you think, well, I've I'm, I'm never studied theology. I've never gone to Bible school or seminary. And I've never uh, preached in a church. And it, it doesn't matter. This girl didn't either. She just said the right word at the right time. It's ap apples of gold and pictures of silver. Pictures of silver, I think it is. That we don't, we, we need to be willing to, to give the good news whenever possible. We find also <clears throat> that there is no power in the help of man, verses 5 through 7. As I mentioned, this letter is sent from Abinadab to, to Joru, I think, who is the, the king, I think it's, which was Ahab's son at the time. And what was sent uh, with Naaman was all of this, this money. The, the money is, a, I think it was 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold and several changes of garments. And these would have been very expensive things uh, which are sent. None of these things would help. If you want to figure out how much money that is, I think gold goes for uh, $1,800 an ounce. Silver goes for $23, I think, right now, an ounce. You see, there's an immense amount of money uh, along with this letter. And this letter is misinterpreted as an act of aggression, verse 7. The letter was probably sent by post before anybody arrived. Caused quite a stir. The, the king couldn't do anything. I mean, obviously, the, uh, the king, however, was not a godly man. The king didn't even give thought to the prophet, Elisha, oh, which he should have. But he, uh, he recognized, I can't help the man. Why is he sending it to me that, uh, for help? So in matters of the soul, there is no help from man. Psalm 60, verse 11. Give us help from trouble, for the help of man is useless. <coughs> we have then the presentation of the gospel, verses 8 through 10. A picture of the presentation of the gospel, verses 8 through 10. A Naaman went down with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. Now we have here that God intervened whenever the, the, the king could do nothing. Elisha the prophet said, let him come to me in verse 8. And the gospel treats all sinners as equal. Remember the picture of Naaman? Naaman comes to the door. Here you have a very powerful man in the kingdom of Syria. The, perhaps the, the head military man of the country. He goes, comes to the door. And a servant answers the door. The, the prophet would not even come out to, to give him the time of day. He sends a messenger out to this, this man. <coughs> so he is greeted by a lowly servant, as treated as any other leper who comes as a beggar to the door. Uh, can you help me? And we have a simple but shocking message <coughs> in verse 10 where it says, Elisha sent a messenger to him, go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. So the message is go and wash, a simple message. So the promise here, if you go and wash, your flesh will be restored to you. Not that just that your disease will be healed, but your flesh will be restored. We have here the picture of the gospel in what it can do for the marred image of God in fallen man. 
The fellowship of God is restored. The power and desire to do what is spiritually good is restored. The uh, ability to love and worship God is restored. All this in the gospel, and that is, of course, through a simple washing. But we also have the carnal response to this message in verse 11. Notice Naaman's response. You think, well, that's a wonderful message, isn't it? I mean, here I am, I'm in a situation I can't help myself. All I have to do is go and wash. Go down to the river and wash. Dip yourself seven times down. Well, how does he respond? But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. He expected some extravagant ritual or something that, uh, that would heal his leprosy. This was an attack on his pride. What do you mean? Get down to the Jordan River. This is a muddy river. Uh, it has really no significance to, to especially Syrians. It's, it's just a muddy old river. And he's to go down and wash? What do you... There, I was expecting some pomp and circumstance. Now, uh, but the, the gospel message comes in plain and simple. But this is the response that we get. Uh, the gospel does not feed the pride of man. And it does not treat people according to their rank. You know, if we give a message of the gospel to President Biden, or we give a message of the gospel to the person in the rescue mission, it's the same message. And we, if we do not alter the message according to their rank. It destroys the pride of man. They are forced to grovel in the dust. You know, I think what this does is it destroys the idea of a seeker-sensitive type of, of message given that we can draw in more people. You know, we need to adjust our message and adjust our, adjust our worship services so that we can draw in the world. That's not what we see here. So what does Naaman do? Naaman goes away. He could not even tolerate the presence of the prophet's servant. So when the message is unsuitable for his taste, he leaves. Matthew 18, verse 3 Surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God. One thing about little children is they're willing to accept. accept a message uh, and not have it hindered by pride. That's what we have here, a message hindered by pride. And notice though, he also gave his own opinion in that verse that we read. It, uh, he should come out and call on the name of his God and wave his hand. He, he is now interjecting his own ideas how I should be healed with my leprosy. You said you see that in the world also when you give the gospel. You know, well, uh, I don't know if that's the case. I need to do this or I need to do this. I need to go through this religious ritual and, and this or that. You know, and then, then that, that would save me. No, that, uh, that's not the case. You must be cleansed according to the way of Scripture. We cannot change this message to suit the sinner. He says, I said to myself in verse 11. You know, this is what we see all the time where I thought... I thought this should be the case, or that should be the case. We have here a case of, I think, Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your way, or neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord, Isaiah 55, verse 8. You know, this is the way it is with the earthly rejection of the gospel. The gospel is rejected because I thought I was good enough. Or my religion 
is good enough. I can control the content. I can determine the content of the message if it's good enough for me. That's the condition of spiritual lepers. And the message to spiritual lepers is your opinion doesn't count. It doesn't matter at all. This is the truth. You either take it or leave it. And at first, Naaman leaves it. We cannot alter the message to suit your fancy. The command is to repent and believe. He says, what about the other? If it's going to be a river, it should be the rivers in Syria. Now, this river has no significance, but, but the rivers at home, they mean a lot more. At least you could send me there. And that's not the case as well. However, we have a change here in name in verse 13. And it's his servants, again, insignificant people, people that were carrying things for him or taking care of his needs. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more than when he says to you, wash and be clean. So we have here the, the servants see, see what's happening. He doesn't do what the prophet tells him to do. He turns around in a fit of rage and leaves. And the, the servants say, this is his opportunity. We've got to stop him. So they intervene. And this is a picture for us as well. Now, we ought to be willing to intervene wherever possible to help change the, the minds of sinners. Now, a marvelous change takes place as Naaman's heart is softened. We don't know what happened, but he is convinced by his servants to turn and go back to the river Jordan. We find verse 14, that he humbled himself. He went down into the river. He submitted to the word of God. He then receives the promised blessing. If you'll notice in verse 14, it says his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child and he was clean. This is what the gospel does for the sinner. Now, it gives complete spiritual restoration. Now, you think a lot of times whenever you go through some, or some difficulties, especially with the skin, whether it's severe burn or uh, an operation, or you're, you're, you have scars, and you're, you're healed from a disease, and that disease leaves its scar. There's none of that. This is a complete and total healing, as if the flesh was brand new. You know, we, we look at a little baby and we see the, the perfection of the baby. You get older and you see the moles coming, you know, and all that. So, oh, wow, and the wrinkles. No, this is the flesh of the baby. That's, this is what the gospel does, complete spiritual restoration. Then we find that Naaman expressed a heart for restitution. He wanted to give, verse 15. Whenever he is healed, he goes to the prophet and he wants to give to the prophet. He, pu he publicly professed faith in the true God, verse 15. He renounced his false gods. Now, it wasn't just that he's adding now Jehovah to his list of worship. This is the true God. I am no longer worshiping these false idols. He saw these idols did nothing for me. The true God, he is, is the one worthy of worship. Then he, he, bring, he, he asked to bring those two mule loads of earth. This was a, 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 a tradition of the time that that you needed the, the soil of, of, the, of the, where the, uh, the God was centered in order to worship. He wanted to take that soil and set up an altar to the true God. And I believe that's, that's what he did. Uh, he uh, expressed his thanks then through an offering, through giving. He, he made efforts toward true worship. He showed concern over his sin also in verse 18. Uh, whenever he was going to have to deal with, with his, his king, the king would go into his temple with his false god, and the king would lead upon him, and he felt that he was convicted about that. Of course, this is very early on in his understanding of the true God. Uh, so he expressed that, please forgive me when this happens. Uh, not sure exactly how to go through all of that, uh, but there is that heart. I think the picture is that, that heart of conviction uh, that, that, that comes about. This shows the bending of the heart and will when true faith is exhibited uh, within the heart. There is going to be this great change. Uh, the Spirit comes convicting of sin and righteousness and judgment. Whenever the Holy Spirit is present, this is what you're going to see. 
a conviction of sin, even potential sin, as we see here. <clears throat> when we go to the next section, we have a great warning against mercenary religion. In verse, verses 20 through 27, of course you know the story. <clears throat> Elisha refused the gift. He, he, the reason he did this was it was very typical of people who wanted healings or special favors of the so-called prophets of the day. Many of them were false prophets, oracles, and so forth. The idea was you came and you always gave a gift. And uh, Elisha said, no, this is not uh, one of those cases. You know, you're not paying me for, uh, he didn't want to look, look like that, you're not paying me for a miracle. And this is coming as a gift from God. So Elisha refused it. And notice how Elisha refused it. Uh, in, let's see, verse 16. But he said, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive them. This is important for the rest of the story. Because what that means is Elisha refused it with an oath. That is to say, it's always like raising your right hand, I take an oath that I will receive nothing. This is important because look what happens right after that. His servant, Gehazi, took this oath lightly. And as soon as he had the opportunity and Elisha was out of sight, he went running toward Gehazi and he saw all of that wealth. I mean, this was millions of dollars in today's money. Uh, if you were to... Uh, to, to calculate how much money was there in those garments, which were very rare in those days. He went running after them. And in doing all of this, he flagrantly violated at least four of the commandments. <coughs> the one being not to take the Lord's name in vain, uh, not to steal, not to bear false witness. He lied, and he coveted. All of this is going on in his heart. And this, I believe, is a sin of unbelief similar to that of Ananias and Sapphira we find in Acts chapter 5. Uh, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from their faith and their greediness, uh, in their greediness, pierced themselves through with many sorrows, 1 Timothy 6.10. And here Gehazi joins the ranks of Judas and Demas, who enjoyed uh, more means of grace than most, but fell because of their love of money, of riches. So we need to be warned of following those who make money the central part of their ministry. You know, and of falling into the same sin. You now when you, you think about uh, these multitude of television preachers, and, and some are not television preachers, but, but preachers in general, that are living high on the hog uh, with multiple houses, mul multiple cars, the best of cars, the best of everything, are going on all of the, t the, the major television shows and probably being reimbursed for that as well and making all kinds of money. And you have to wonder uh, about the heart of such an individual. Now, as we mentioned, <clears throat> this, the pictures here, and we'll close with this. If you'll turn over to Luke chapter 4, I want to just, just give our Lord's commentary on this as well. <clears throat> Luke chapter 4. <clears throat> Verses 24 through 27. And here we have the Jews being rejected by our Lord. You know, that uh, They rejected him. Verse 20. I believe he's in the synagogue. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant, sat down in the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he said to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And so all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceed out, proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, You will surely say this pro proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, you also hear in your country. In other words, the very people that, that knew him rejected him. And this was to be the case all through the nation of Israel. The Jewish leadership rejected the Lord. And he goes then to an illustration, actually two. The first one has to deal with the widow woman that Elijah gave special privilege to. 
uh, throughout the famine and provided for her. And the other was Naaman. Verse 20, I'm sorry, verse uh, 27. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So he just makes mention of Naaman, thinking of all of the, of the lepers that were in Israel, but only one was cleansed, and he wasn't even an Israelite. This is picturing the uh, great grace that's going to come upon the Gentile world, which we are the recipients of, uh, that came uh, as a result of, of the gospel and the rejection. We'll get into this when we get to Romans 10 and 11. The rejection of the Jews with the gospel went over to the Gentiles. Uh, and so uh, we have here that, that the Jews seeing this became very angry and attempted to kill the Lord Jesus. And so I think we have, as, as I mentioned, a lot of, of good pictures in that story. And there's a lot more we probably could get into, but our time uh, doesn't permit. And so I hope that was helpful in looking at the, the story of Naaman. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we once again are grateful for what you have done in your word in recording these stories for us, the many lessons that we have there. Lord, may uh, these, uh, this, this story in particular have a special blessing to those who came this evening. May it be of spiritual help to them. May you use it to prepare them for uh, the difficulties and temptations that they'll face throughout the week and encourage them in truth. Pray in Jesus' name.